What's up, everyone? Welcome to this issue of Motive Garage as we continue the development on our R32 GTR Project Budget Supercar. Now, as you know, we set the time for the quickest stock bottom end GTR as far as we know in the world with a 992, and we did that with a completely OEM block rotating assembly, pump, sump, the whole lot. So we're pretty impressed with what it did. Now, we did have a couple of problems though, and that was we were pressurizing the cooling system when we ran over 30 pound of boost, and we also were starting to lose compression. So if you saw the live stream on our Facebook page, you would have seen that we pulled it down to take a closer look. Now we knew that we were pressurizing the cooling system because we never decked the block or the head, so that was an easy fix, but we didn't know why we were losing compression. Then we pulled it down, all of the rotating assembly, was perfect. So we basically said, well, we'll put fresh rings and bearings and put it back together as long as the block's all right. Now, I had a crack on the outside, a couple of hairline cracks between the head studs and the water gallows, which we could live with. But when we sent the block away to the machine shop, we found out that all of the bores were out of round from three to six thou, and that's where our compression went. And the problem with that is, though, can't be fixed, and that engine is for the bin. So basically, we overpowered the block, or literally, it just got old. So that left us in a bit of a conundrum of what to do next. And this is where things get pretty interesting. Now we sat there and thought, well, let's find a new block. But the problem is you're not gonna find a secondhand Virgin RB26 block that can accept factory pistons as they are so that we can make it back to factory again. And if you did, it'd be pretty rare. The other option was to buy a brand new block. But we said, I'm not gonna spend $3,000 on a brand new block just to go build a stock bottom end for a few months to turn up and potentially throw a rod out the side. So what we've decided to do is go and get a complete running compression tested engine, which would basically be the same as what you guys would do if you pulled your engine out of the car to copy the mods that we do. Now, rather than just stick with a completely OEM bottom end, we've decided to go one step further and do what we call OEM plus. Basically, we're gonna upgrade some things that we know need upgrading in the bottom end to not just handle a little bit more power than what we want, but to also enable our car to do some circuit racing. Now, if you wonder what that means, we had a stock pump and a stock sump before. Now, with a stock pump, you're gonna be very careful to start off the limiter, which we do, but not everyone's able to do that. So we are gonna to upgrade to a Nido pump on this car, and we're also gonna put an aftermarket balancer on. And we're also gonna put an aftermarket sump, and that's what's gonna help us be able to do some circuit racing because these things suffer massively from oil surge around corners. But the actual rotating assembly itself is going to stay standard. Now we're going to do head gasket and studs just like you would if you were doing the same power upgrades as us. Uh, but we may send the head away for a little bit more work than the last one. We're not going to do too much on the ports in case we put a leg out of the uh, a leg out of bed on this stock bottom end in terms of rotating assembly, but we are going to do a little bit of tidy up, double valve springs, oversized valves, and do a little bit more head work so we can push the power a little higher. What's our goal? Low nines, stock rotating assembly. Right, so our first step was to find a running compression tested engine. We put the call out on Facebook, talked to our usual friends, uh, and Matt from Red Sun called me and said, hey bro, I have a 26 sitting in a rack out the front, do you want it? And I said, has it been compression tested? He said, yeah, about a year ago. It got compression tested when it nearly got sold. He goes, but it's been sitting there for a year, do you want to take it? So we've gone, all right, we'll take it. It's probably the dirtiest, ugliest, grubbiest RV26 I've seen, but then again, my last wrecker engine went for six years. So you never know what this one's gonna do. Now the first step is we need to take all the ancillaries off this engine, we need to take the head off to go away to the machine shop, we're going to pull the sump off so we can at least inspect the bottom end uh, and have an overall checkup on the health of this engine before we get going on the mods. Let's do it. Twin turbos are always junk. Even when all you want to do is throw in the bin they piss you off. Why? Rounded nuts, studs that are broken, seized up crap, can't get to it, they're junk.
The engine looked good at first glance, but we left it for the boys from CID to take a look while we sent the head off to the machine shop and sorted out some other things on the car. Being banned from the track for running sub 10s and going over 140 mile per hour, we needed to get the car teched for drag racing if we wanted to continue our development of the car on our channel. Not cheap, but we had to get it done for you guys. We had our longtime friend Chris Spicer, who now works at JT Performance, do our roll cage and parachute mount, but we'll be showing that in full detail in a future episode of Motive Garage, where we cover how to tech your car for drag racing. Now with the bottom end and the external parts not changing on our GDR, we decided the next logical step would be to upgrade the head. Plus, we wanted to see just how much of a difference having a big head would make to power. We teamed up with the guys from Faber Australia and Supertech to use the entire Supertech catalogue in our new head. Oversized valves, dual valve springs, titanium retainers, new buckets to suit longer valves and going shimless, new guides, locks and seals. Now with the GTR Festival fast approaching and our head build getting way out of control, we decided to save the serious head for a more serious bottom end that we're also building for the future. In the meantime, we decided to put our stock head back onto our stock bottom end. Now that head just has Supertech single valve springs, Tomei Type B pond cams and adjustable cam gears, which means we're keeping our engine cheap and cheerful. We will be taking a look at those Supertech products more in the future when we build that head. Now we did decide to continue though with our plan of upgrading the oil pump, the sump and the balancer. First up, let's catch up with Jim from Nido Performance Engineering to get the lowdown on RB oil pumps. So, um, I've been at the um, forefront of the RB scene since the mid-90s. Uh, obviously my background is from CRD. We literally pioneered um, the RB scene in Australia because we we're really the first performance shop to be uh, involved with them. Having been involved with so many RBs and big horsepower ones at that time as well, especially for, for the 90s and early 2000s, I took that experience and uh, de developed my own pump. So oil pumps was, um, was something that we found was always a bit of a niggling issue with RBs. And uh, so what we basically did is I sat down and um, developed a pump which I knew was going to be the next level in terms of um, production-wise, component strength and so on. Um, Nissan obviously knew there was a problem themselves because back in the late 80s and early 90s, they were uh, doing the short snout drive on the crankshafts. They've obviously realised there was an issue in the Series 1 uh, RB26s and then fixed the problem up in the Series 2 R32s. But it still goes a step further than that. The biggest downfall is um, the component or the material that the actual gears are made from is what they call a sintered type material. Um, that itself lends itself to uh, instantly cracking under um, shock loads. Uh, shock loads we found come from a number of things. Uh, most common thing nowadays is um, you know, your anti-lags, two-step limiters, that sort of thing, um, as well as uh, harmonics which are a primary killer of a pump. So the factory cranks um, don't have um, full counter-rotating or counter-balancing, whereas the aftermarket billet crankshafts have. So on the, on the dyno, for example, that actually makes, that will make horsepower and also will make the pumps live longer and uh, a lot of other things which, which benefits the, uh, even the block engine harmonics from the, the cause block cracking and whatever else. The physical size of the RB26 snout on the crankshaft always lends a tool some certain flex. That certain flex has been proven or to be part of the reason why the inner gear will sometimes jam onto the outer gear and what do you think is going to happen if you've got a inner gear deciding it's going to lock up on an outer gear because the crank flexed at 7000 rpm the crank's not going to stop the oil pump's going to stop. When the oil pump gears stop they snap. It uh, doesn't matter what material they're made out of. Uh, what I've done is I've incorporated in certain parts of the, the gearing process additional clearance where it needs to be required without sacrificing idle pressure, without sacrificing drivability and ultimately um, top end oil pressure. Taking that into consideration, knowing that there's going to be some factor of that always in an RB26, we went out and uh, designed our own gears with our own materials, incorporated a billet backing plate which we know and we've seen on testing will not flex compared to the normal cast thin backing plate that 
some of the, well, the factory pumps have. Where our pump is unique, it's they're completely hand built. That allows us to have uh, the tolerances that we require. It allows us to pair up the gear so that everything's perfectly paired up. As far as your quality control, it's 100%. Castings or our housings are, are all gravity cast. Uh, that's well known to be a lot better than die cast. Our backing plate is a 7075 uh, billet alloy. Try bend that material, stronger than steel, especially with the extra thickness that we've got, uh, which also allows us to have a more grooving in the on the inside. So there's actually more flow that's incorporated partly in the housing because it's a it's a taller housing, plus also in the backing plate. So there's more flow going to the gears, so that minimises cavitation and so on. Our gears are a combination of CNC and EDM Y-cut. They are from EN26 material, precision pairing of all the uh, all the gears. So we can tweak things as far as with oil pressure, and we give customers a few options of oil pressure and crack off pressure with um, the relief valves and so on. Okay, so the Modi DVD. Uh, GTR. Um, there's a lot of questions out there about guys saying, you know, why didn't, you know, you don't have a stock oil pump on it or why didn't you break a pump and whatever else. So, I mean, there are ways around it. Um, they're not going to be a forever thing, but they definitely can extend the life of your oil pump. We made sure to address that, or I did, made sure I addressed the tune side of it. So we're never going to be overly aggressive on, you know, banging on rev limiters. And that's one thing that we, that we spoke about. RPM limit reasonable, you know, 8250, so we're not sort of trying to stretch that stock pump. I was able to um, set up the tune in a way where I knew the pump was going to live a lot longer. In a short term or, you know, medium term, it's, it's, a, it's a fix, but it's never going to be a long term fix. There is no way I would have given that to a regular customer because it would not last. It probably, you'd be probably gone for a drive up the road and come back with a broken oil pump. But we never, we never had an oil pump failure on your car. And that was uh, a testament to the whole program, and that was also got to do with the driving ability, the looking after the car, how to how to drive the car, or how to drive the motor, uh, how to set up the tune properly, uh, and and a few other little factors that sort of go into it. So, upgrading to Nido pump now is going to allow us to get those extra RPM that we want. We can go more aggressive with a two-step off the line, so you can actually then launch it off the line, not just try and ride the clutch and get the revs there. Just have the peace of mind that it's, you're not always having in the back of your mind, is it going to break? When's it going to break? When's that oil going to come on? You know, like that sort of thing. Upgrading the oil pump um, is part of a package, really. So to upgrade an oil pump on an RB26, it's not just a matter of let's bolt the oil pump on and off we go and the motor's going to live forever. And take the pressure side of it away, there's a dramatic increase in flow. What you need to do then is you need to increase your capacity. You've got to realistically go a lot more because the pump will push a lot more volume. So there's going to be some more oil up in the top of the motor than what there would have been with the stock oil pump. We believe you don't go the way of trying to drop the oil pressure of one of our pumps to fit your oil flow issues. We believe what you do and what a lot of other people are doing nowadays is they will restrict the flow to the head. You want to have a baffled sump because it doesn't matter how good the pump is, if it's got no oil to feed to the engine, things are going to go wrong pretty quick. The guys who are really serious will do a um, oil return, like a head return. Probably better to give a list of how many don't run. <laughs> Our pump is more than how many do run. Look, there's countless cars out there that are running 10 second passes, 8 second passes, 9 second passes and whatever else. We're still using wet systems and they're using our pumps. So that itself is a testament to um, the confidence that professional workshops, you know, like your Matooks, like your CRDs and other, and other guys, that. Um, that ultimately use a lot of our components because they prove how good their setup is. But by doing that, they also pr have prove how good our setups are. Now, as Jim mentioned, engines generate harmonics due to the crank bending and natural resonance. Now, as the RPM and the power increases, the harmonics get worse, and this vibration can cause engine fatigue or even failure of various parts in the engine. Now, a harmonic balancer is fitted to an engine to try and absorb these harmonics and help dissipate them as well. Now, our original engine had the factory rev limit, therefore we deemed that the factory balancer was sufficient, but with increased power, and now we want increased RPM, we need to upgrade our engine balancer. We went Australian design and manufactured with Ross Performance Parts. We opted for their Ross Tough Bond Race Series Harmonic Damper rated to 1,000 horsepower. It incorporates anti-vibration and anti-wear natural rubber and has laser etched 360 degree timing marks. It meets SFI standards for all types of racing. 
It's modular and can be configured with underdriven pulleys, which we did for the power steering, and you can remove the aircon pulley and add a dry sump pulley if required. We also opted for the trigger wheel already installed, giving us the option of adding a crank trigger system later. Now, just like our previous stock bottom end engine setup, we needed to install aftermarket head studs. This time, we decided to try out some ones from Tomei. We also needed to upgrade our head gasket, and once again, we went for Nido Performance Engineering. RB26s and head gaskets, so here's the, the lowdown. Out of all the blocks I've ever bought, brand new from Nissan, forget the, the used ones that we pulled apart. I have never seen a head gasket surface that's been absolutely flat. Uh, to suit a, uh, a metal head gasket. So metal head gaskets require what we call super smooth finish. So it's gotta be absolutely pristine flat for that gasket to seal properly, as opposed to your typical sort of paper in your factory type gasket, which it's obviously not very strong, but it, it allows itself to get into the dips and grooves and whatnot and seal at low power levels. When we're developing a head gasket, um, obviously we wanted to develop a head gasket that was better than what's out there and we developed our dual bore seal, we call it, it's a DBS gasket, and that has a, like a double O-ring around the, the sealing surface of the head gasket area to, to the bore. That allows us to have more clamping pressure, specifically just around that area, instead of trying to spread it through just the whole head gasket. In the case of uh, the Motive DVD GDR, uh, one of the biggest flaws, I guess, that it had, putting a metal head gasket on it, there was no machining surface says machine, you know, the flat surfaces weren't machined. It was literally clean it up and off you go. And you can see the grooves. You can see that the rough grooves machined from factory. Once you do go for the metal gasket, which is going to be far superior than any other composite gasket, um, you must have uh, a gasket surface, which is literally mirror finish with, on the block and on the head. Now we also had some tidying up to do on the GTR and we had our friend Daniel DeSano tidying up the engine bay back to factory finish and also fixed and painted our front bar as I was pretty sick of all those terrible photos of the car. Now we also needed to tidy up some wiring in the engine bay as it's starting to get pretty old and starting to look worse for wear. There is two options at this point, custom make your own wiring or purchase a new loom from the guys at Wiring Specialties in the USA. They make engine loom, gearbox looms and coil pack looms and more. Everything you need to either do a conversion or a restoration on your GTR. They are made to OEM standard with all the correct connectors and tags. They not only look better in the bay, but perform better than the 25 year old plugs and wiring. They are available in Australia from Kudos Motorsport along with a large range of other Japanese performance car looms. Now with all of our parts arrived and the head machined, it was time for the boys from CRD to inspect the bottom end, put in some fresh bearings and get our engine together. However, this is where our story takes a turn and starts to deviate. Now looking at the bottom end, all of the uh, carbon deposits over the pistons made them look stock, but wait for it. When the boys pulled the pistons out to clean the rings, turns out they were old forgies. Now most people would be celebrating at this time that they got some free forge pistons in their engine, however we wanted to continue the stock bottom end development. Now three days before GDR Festival I had a choice. I could pull the pin on that engine and I'd have to go buy another engine and lose more money, or B, put some rods in it and send it. I think it was a pretty easy choice. In part two of our budget supercar rebuild, we put the engine together and make some power. <laughs> 